Hello and welcome to um, the Rubens house. We are of course in the former house and workshop of the painter Peter Paul uh, Rubens and I. Um, I am the curator or the director of the Rubens house uh, museum and my name is Ben van Beneden. I'm going to take you through the house but I suppose it is best to start in the courtyard uh, of the house. When Rubens came back from Italy in 1608, he um, got married with an Antwerp girl, Isabella Brandt. And after two years, the young couple bought a house with grounds very near to the most important street of Antwerp, uh, the Mer. A couple of years later, he started to rebuild the house and he also significantly enlarged uh, the premises. And for inspiration, he looked, of course, to Italy. Behind me is the famous garden screen. It has the form of a Roman triumphal arch. But certain details also point to Italian late Renaissance architecture. For example, the uh, central arch of the portico is inspired by no one other than Michelangelo. It is not a round arch, as you can see, the arch is geniculated, and that is a specific invention made by Michelangelo. On top of the garden screen, we see two Olympian gods. One is Mercury, and the other goddess is Minerva. And Rubens, uh, by putting those statues of those gods on top of the garden screen, he says to the visitors, my house is dedicated to the arts and to wisdom and to knowledge. And then all that will bring you to virtue, which is personified by another god, or better, a semi-god, Hercules. Hercules in the 17th century was the absolute hero of virtue. And in a nutshell, that kind of represents the philosophy and the artistic vision of Peter Paul Rubens, who was not just a brilliant painter, but Rubens was also a learned painter or a humanist painter. And he is in a way looking to the art of the past to make the art of the future. Now, these elements are fully original. Uh, they were designed by Rubens and after over 400 years, they are still here. The rest of the house is more or less reconstruction. Behind me, for example, the, we see the facade of Rubens' studio, his, his famous workshop. And in the 17th century, that facade would have been decorated by Rubens in Tremblay painting. So illusionistic painting to look like sculpture. And today, of course, um, those paintings are no longer there. But what we see is fairly correct. Um, the iconography, the meaning, uh, the message is conveyed, that's all correct. But again, in the 17th century, it was, it was painted. I suggest we, we now take a look um, inside. Hello again, we are now in the uh, parlor, so in the first room of the museum, and we are now in the old house. Uh, and behind me, we see two engravings, works on paper, and they are the oldest uh, portraits of the house. They, they show the house how it looked like, or must have looked like, at the time uh, of, of, of Rubens. And in fact, those engravings formed the basis of the reconstructions of the house in the 20th century. Let's move on. The next room that we're visiting is the dining room. And there's, there's plenty to, to see um, here. We have portraits and we have still life paintings. For example, the painter of that one is no one other than Franz Snyders. And Franz Snyders was generally considered as the, the most important 
the most talented, most skillful still life painter of the 17th century. He was a friend of Rubens. We know that both uh, painters uh, worked together on, on, on several uh, paintings, so Snyder then would concentrate on the uh, flowers, vegetables, still life elements, and Rubens would concentrate on the figures. We know that Rubens was an admirer of Franz Snyder's works, and he also owned a number of, of paintings um, by Franz Snyder's. Behind me is uh, a portrait. It's a longer term loan from a private collection, and it is an unfinished portrait of a young lady, a rather beautiful young lady, um, holding a chain. We don't know who she is, but we do know that the portrait was painted in Italy. It was painted around 1605, 1606, when Rubens was living and working in Italy. It is unfinished, as you can see when we look at the edges, and also the, the dress of the woman is painted very sketchily, very rapidly. It is a kind of, well, it's really a virtuoso picture in the sense that it is painted with economy of means, very quickly, and maybe, I, I can't, we can't be sure about that, Rubens painted it in no more than a day. Maybe it was a preparatory work, or maybe it is a work that he abandoned for some reason. Nevertheless, it is still a very strong uh, portrait. There's another portrait in this room that requires um, special attention. This is the portrait of, or a portrait, of uh, Helena Furma, and Helena Furma was Rubens' second wife. Uh, four years after the death of his first wife, Isabella Brandt, who died from an infectious disease at a fairly young age, he married Helena. Like Isabella Brandt, Helena Furma was also from Antwerp. She was also much younger than uh, Rubens. This portrait is a reduced copy of a larger um, portrait, a full-length portrait, which is now in, in Munich, and which was probably painted on the occasion of Helena's marriage to Rubens. It is painted by Rubens and Studio, so we assume that the dress and the jewels were painted by Rubens' assistant, or assistance, and that the face was touched up or retouched by the master. Now, Helena Fuma um, plays a fairly important role in Rubens' life. When he married uh, this woman, Rubens was already 53, but one could say that she kind of gave Rubens a second youth. Helena became his muse. You see Helena, from the moment they got married, you see Helena appearing in all sorts of disguises in uh, Rubens' picture. As Venus, for example, the goddess of love, or as one of the beautiful woman, uh, women in Allegories of Love. Um, and in that sense, I'm pretty sure that she really had an impact on his life uh, and art. I suggest that we now go to the art gallery um, room. So, an art gallery room, um, the name speaks for itself. It's, it's a room where works of art are being kept and displayed and, and every important citizen and certainly wealthy citizens would have had such a room in the house. And Rubens was, of course, no exception, except that his house would have been absolutely full with works uh, of art. But there are some, some specific objects that um, here in this room that require our attention. And, and this is this is one of them. It's, it's a small-scale sculpture or 
statuette. It's Adam and Eve, and they are carved in ivory out of one elephant's tooth. Now, the re one of the reasons that I'm talking about this little sculpture is not just because it is beautiful, it's an exquisite object, but also because Rubens designed such objects. Um, he had in his workshop a number of exceptional um, sculptors and ivory carvers who executed small ivories after Rubens' design. And few people know that. Um, Rubens was a man of many talents, was an exceptional painter. He designed uh, tapestries, he designed uh, title pages, uh, book illustrations, but also sculptures, small-scale sculptures and silverwork. So, a beautiful ivory carved by Georg Petel, a German uh, sculptor who worked in Rubens' workshop in the 1620s. The centerpiece is, again, um, a still life by Adrian van Utrecht. He was one of the star still life painters of, of Antwerp. This particular still life is, is one of the works that are really uh, dear to my heart. It is very sober, very simple. The only thing that we see are luscious vegetables. But the thing that makes this, or the element that makes this picture work is in fact the superb lighting of the picture. It has a certain dynamism that is very, very peculiar or very special um, in still life painting. It, 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 it is as if the, there's, there's a drama, a vegetable drama, going on in this particular uh, uh, picture. Look at the light in, in, in this cabbage and the detail of all those intricate uh, elements. It's, in a way, you could look at this as a, as a tribute to nature. But of course, it's, it's, it's also very painted. It's, it's excitement in, in, in paint. The art gallery is a room in the old house, so the, the uh, part of the house that Rubens bought that he didn't rebuild. But there is one element that was designed uh, by Rubens, and that's the so-called uh, Pantheon. It was Rubens' sculpture museum. It was here that he displayed his fabulous collection of antique or ancient uh, marbles, antiquities. But the architectural novelty is the fact that it was domed and lit by an oculus, so a round hole in top of the roof. And there's one antiquity that I would like to point out here, and that is, of course, the bust in the center, a bust that we now call the Pseudo Seneca. Everybody thought, certainly Rubens uh, thought, that that man represented the uh, Stoic philosopher Seneca. And in Rubens' life, and in the life of many of Rubens' friends, Seneca in Stoic philosophy was a kind of, of beacon, um, something that they would live with, with, with those particular thoughts, uh, peace of mind. You have to be balanced. You have to keep your emotions under control. Use your brain, use your reason. Recently, it has been suggested by one of my colleagues, Professor Kuhn Jonkere, that these particular um, emperor portraits, and there must have been 12, probably, um, were painted by Rubens to decorate his own house. And more in particular, they probably hung in the sculpture museum in the Pantheon. As you can see when you zoom in, they are very sketchily painted, very loosely painted. Um, so they don't have a finished character. And that was 
or is an extra argument to assume that they were in fact painted for private use in the house. So here we are in the other part of the, the house and here we have um, one of Rubens' uh, self-portraits and there aren't many. Now Rubens was a great portrait painter but he did not like portraiture. Um, in the 16th century and the 17th century portraiture was considered as a lower genre. It was not an important genre. Everybody could paint portraits because making a portrait is just painting what you see. For Rubens that was not um, exciting enough. It didn't require much invention. And what is remarkable in the case of Rubens is that he painted a number, not a lot, um, of self-portraits. And this is, this is one of them. It is usually dated um, around 1630, maybe a bit earlier. And as we can see, it is, it's a bust portrait. And again, it is highly unfinished. Only the face is fully finished. All the rest is very sketchily painted. And that suggests to us that it was made for his own use. By which I mean that it probably that it was probably displayed in the house, but it was also used as a model for group portraits of Rubens in the company of other people. And we know certainly two or three examples in which this particular pose of Rubens appears. And um, this portrait has only recently been uh, restored. At the, it, it is, of course, almost the icon of the Rubens house and um, of the uh, city of Antwerp. During restoration, almost eight, could have been more, layers of overpaint were remo removed, as well as a number of layers of, of, of yellowed uh, of varnish. And now we are, well, very close to the way that the portrait looked like in the um, 17th century. We are almost underneath um, Rubens' um, skin. This particular picture was painted by a German artist, Wilhelm Schubert von Ehrenberg. And this one is a, is a very, well, unique example within his oeuvre because it shows the interior of the Jesuit church in, in Antwerp. And one of the remarkable items was the fact that it was entirely decorated in marble. What makes this painting so special is the fact that it is also painted on marble. So it's a picture not painted on canvas, not painted on panel, but painted on stone. That's why it needs special support. It's incredibly heavy. It is, of course, also an important uh, church in, in many, many other ways. Uh, Rubens, for example, was closely uh, involved in the decoration of this church, the um, pictorial decoration and also the sculpture decoration. The final room for this um, film is uh, more or less the apotheosis, the studio. This must have been a bustling room. You would have had people preparing panels, boys preparing paints, pigments, assistants working on pictures, different pictures at the same time. And Rubens kind of in the middle like a stage director, giving orders, correcting were necessary, putting final touches, etc., etc. So not a quiet room, but almost a kind of small factory. And no better picture to start with than this small portrait, which 
carries a particular story. It's a portrait of the young Anthony van Dyck. And van Dyck was, of course, we all know, know that, um, van Dyck was Rubens' most important assistant. Um, he wasn't necessarily a pupil of Rubens, although he learned a lot from the master. And it was only um, later in his teens that he was recruited by Rubens to come and work in the Rubens workshop. And we assume that this portrait was more or less painted around the time that Anthony van Dyck arrived in Rubens's workshop. We believe it is not painted by Rubens, but painted by van Dyck himself. So in fact, we are almost certainly looking at a self-portrait by van Dyck. So one theory, one hypothesis may be that the young van Dyck entered Rubens' workshop and he painted a self-portrait for Rubens in the style of the master, more or less to suggest, I can paint like you. And what we see here is a boy, a young man, an adolescent um, of you know, 16, 17 years, very self-assured, looking at himself in the mirror and well, about to embark on a magnificent uh, career. This is one of the star pieces of the museum and certainly one of my personal um, favorites. Well, it's a battle scene, as you can see, and it depicts an episode from the life of Henry IV, the, the, the French king, and the husband of Maria de' Medici, and in fact, the picture was commissioned by Maria de' Medici to celebrate the life of her deceased husband. But the picture was left unfinished, and the reason is, is very simple. At a certain moment in history, Maria de' Medici lost power, and the commission, the important commission, was abandoned altogether. Uh, and this, was, this picture was, was in his workshop um, when Maria de' Medici was out. And so he just left the commission. And in fact, you, you could also say that we're looking at a big, a large modello, um, because you actually see the painter at work. Here we see Rubens working directly on the canvas. You see, you see his brush strokes. You, you, you almost hear him think. You almost hear him breathe while working on this uh, picture. It's really, it's almost like an, an, an action painting. It's not just an action scene. When we look closely, when you zoom in, you can see that it is painted by two hands. And also that the top layer of that picture is finished, contrary to the main scene uh, below. And the top was painted by someone called Peter Snyers, a painter from Brussels, who specialized in landscapes and in battle scenes, so-called batalis. That was his forte, and it was used by Rubens to fill in the upper half of that picture. Apart from the fact that I find it, personally find it very exciting, it also tells us a lot about the way Rubens set up a composition. You can also see him taking risks because some of those poses, and, and that is pretty, we find it in many, many Rubens pictures, the variety in, in poses, difficult poses. Well, that is what we see here. It is, it is so utterly and truly Rubens. With this picture, we kind of go back in time. We uh, enter 
the period of the early Rubens, it is generally assumed that this is one of the few pictures, one of the few remaining pictures, painted by Rubens before he went to Italy. And it shows Adam and Eve in paradise. Composition based on a print by Marcantonio Raimondi, the famous engraver who worked together with, with Raphael. Not every Rubens scholar accepts that it is in fact by Rubens. Um, it has been suggested that it is in fact by Otto van Veen, Rubens' last teachers. We don't know. So Rubens' scholarship remains undecided. It could be van Veen, but it could also be, uh, be Rubens. And there's a very strong case to be made uh, for Rubens. In my view, this is too good to be by uh, van Veen, but what we are intending to do is to have this picture um, closely examined, um, technically examined, so material technical analysis um, might reveal who actually painted this uh, uh, picture. The final painting that I would like to show to the view is, is not by Rubens, but by Van Dyck. It is in fact the Apostle Matthew. At the time, Van Dyck would have been, say, 18 or 19 years um, of age. It is an apostle, but at the same time, this picture can also be considered as a head study. So, a study of a remarkable, in this case, beautiful head, a head that would have been used and that was in fact used as a kind of, you know, background figure, supporting actor, if you like, in a larger picture. That kind of practice of making head studies, head studies of remarkable heads, that was of course a practice that Rubens had taken from Italy, and we see this particular man appearing in a handful of early Van Dyck pictures in the background. It is painted in a different style than Van Dyck's self-portrait, a portrait that we talked about earlier on uh, in, in the film. It is very uh, loosely painted. It shows a, a, a self-confidence that is unmatched for a boy of 18, 19. And you see how he kind of applies this, this wet, you know, the, the, the wet paint in one, you know, blow almost to suggest a white shirt underneath the cloak of, of, of the young man. It's the, the confidence of this picture is, is uh, remarkable. And it is really one of those pictures that in its, in its basic composition, it, it is very, is very simple. Uh, there's not a lot of excitement with regard to the color scheme. It's almost monochromatic, but the power and the force of this, of this painting is, is just wonderful. And also the way, uh, the material aspect of this picture, the, the way that Van Dyck applies paint is, well, I can look at this painting for hours. Well, um, I sincerely hope that you've um, enjoyed this little tour. There's um, much more to see um, in the Rubens House Museum. Um, but I hope that this gave you an incentive and a reason um, to come to the museum when we reopen. And I do hope from the bottom of my heart that we will reopen very soon. And in the meantime, um, I can only say um, thank you again and stay safe.